How's everyone today? Good. Everyone's excited about getting into their fears? Who would like to do some roaming microphones today for us? Thank you. On this side, one on this side. Okay, thank you. Good lad. Okay. Well, so today is about uh, feeling your fears. So we could call it fear processing, shall we? Um, so you know how we've talked a lot about emotional processing and releasing emotions? Can you just, there's a, no, I'll show you where it is done. If you just turn, I'm controlled by this one here. So if you hear it ringing, just back it off a bit there. And that's, that, that's the one that's where, where that you would use. Yeah, so um, today, as I said, we, we could call today fear processing. And we've done a fair bit of emotional processing, and some of you have already gotten into that and felt, felt the benefits of that. Some of you, I can feel your joy has increased in that process. Some of you feel a bit stuck. And the reason why we get stuck, like we said yesterday, is because we've basically got some blocks. And the blockages are all surrounding our fears. So that's what yesterday we discussed a lot of, what we can do about practical things we can do to connect to our fears. So what I'm trying to do today is to start you off on that process. So if you could think about the next five or six weeks as a, as a solid few weeks that you can start accessing some of these fears, that would be really lovely. Now, some of you are really concerned about this process. Some of you feel that all we're doing is trying to desensitize you, perhaps, from feeling your emotions and from being a sensitive person, and that's not actually the case. What I'm trying to do, if you remember, if you were a celestial spirit, if you were at one with God, you would have no fear about anything that's happening. That means that in every situation here on earth, for example, you would have no fear in that situation. You would only have a feeling of love and compassion in that situation. You also wouldn't have any grief about the situation. Right? You would only have love and compassion about the situation and not the grief. So that being the case, every single celestial spirit can look upon what's going on on the earth and there is a lot of very, very damaging things going on on the earth, of course, going on all the time around us. And they can look upon that with complete love in every situation. And that's where you will be in the end of your progression as well, in the same state as that, living on the earth but being able to look at everything in a condition of love. You might just want to adjust mine down a little further. Thanks, Mary. And so what we want to do is get to that state of being able to see everything through, through love. Now, most people on the earth think that the way to get into that state is to manufacture that state in their mind. And that's where most of our errors begin. Most of our errors start by trying to manufacture states in our mind. On the divine love path, what we're trying to do is get into the state emotionally so we don't have to do anything with our mind anymore. So, you know, with our mind, we have to do recurring practices. Like you might have the recurring practice of meditation, for example, to help you get into a certain zone every day. What I'm suggesting is in the end you won't need that at all because you'll be in that zone without meditating every day. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, the same goes with your fear. With your fear, we want to get to the state where no matter what happens in your life, you don't have any fear about it. Now, you imagine how freeing that becomes. So at the moment, a lot of times our fear is like these barred walls surrounding us and it prevents us from going every, to, to go places where we've got the bars. Mary uh, likened it this morning we, or last night we were talking and she likened it to like a maze. When we, we start here, here's where we were born, let's say, when we're starting to have a con part of consciousness in our existence, and then we progress a little way and then something happens, like some kind of painful event occurs and we go off on this direction. And then another painful event occurs and we go here and another painful event, and then we go here and then we go here and then we go here and then we go here. And we're going all over the place with our painful directions, right? With all of these different painful things that are all just... We're bypassing, we're trying to bypass our fears every time, right? Our fear of pain in most cases. And so eventually we start 
that's what our life looks like to a lot of us, right? And when we look back on it, it looks back, we look back and we think of it as a bit of a mess, don't we, sometimes, right? <laughs> now, obviously, we want to get to the stage where everything we desire and everything we love just comes to us. So in other words, we're not going through this maze all the time, but rather we have a very definite purpose within ourselves. Not that anybody else defines your purpose, that, but the purpose is within you. Your desires and your passions are being realised. Now for that to occur, this maze of fear has to be undone. All right? Because it's that maze of fear that determines your next step. You see, your next step is actually determined by all of the unhealed emotions inside of you from all of the previous things that happened to you. And this is why, you know, often doctors and psychologists call it the subconscious and so forth, because it seems like something outside of our control, but within us, has control of our life, but we don't know what. But in reality, what it is, is all the things that we're afraid of and all the things that have happened to, us, have happened to us that are unreleased within us have left their signature there. And that signature defines the next move every single time. So, for example, if one of you ladies have had two or three relationships, right, from the time you're... Uh, long-term relationships I'm talking about, from the time, say, that you were, um, you know, 17 or 18 years of age till now, and every single one of those relationships was a harmful relationship to you. Let's say it was a, every single one of those relationships was abusive. You're going to be very, very wary about the next relationship, aren't you? Unless you've healed those relationships and all the emotions in those relationships. And the, you have good reason to be wary of the next relationship because if you've had three harmful relationships in a row, it means that there must have been a cause from your childhood that you're actually yet to release from you that's creating these. And so, of course, we feel like, wow, I don't know if I want to enter another relationship now. Like, you know, I could get another abusive man. And then we go down the track. Rather than feeling the fears and the different grieves, grieving things that we need to go through with regard to the relationship, what we finish up doing is fearing another relationship so much that we go into anger. And we go into anger with men. So we're all men are bastards, you know, like, I don't want to have another relationship. I'm perfectly happy alone, I've heard many say. And I say, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if that's what you want to believe, that's fine. And the truth is that the only reason why we say we're perfectly happy alone because we've now lost all hope that we'll ever have any kind of relationship that's satisfying to us with a person that is actually going to be good to us, right? And so we give up all that hope and all that hope just goes out of our life and we're now in this state with no, no, the best state I can be in is by myself. That's going to be my happiest state. Well, the truth is that God designed you to be in a much happier state than that. But we often go down that track because of our fears dictating to us what's going on in our life. And if we don't understand what the cause is, then it becomes very, very difficult to sort it all out inside of, us, inside of ourselves. So that just gives you an illustration of how fear dictates to you the rest of your life. This happens over and over again with most people in their life. For example, financially, you see this happening all the time, right? So you have one or two financial failures. Let's say you had a business or two businesses and eventually those businesses failed. Uh, or something went wrong and you've now got very little money. Now, the whole thought of getting into the business has a huge emotional signature around it. And so you're afraid of getting into business, you don't really want to, and you'll do one of two things. You'll either not get into business or you'll get into business again and you'll try to plan the whole thing out to the nth degree. And because the emotion is still within you and it's unhealed, that business will fail just as much as the others did too. Does that make sense? And so then you go through all the process again of, oh, I don't know if I'm cut out for business. Well, the truth is everyone is. Everyone can do it if you want to do it, but you have to heal the emotions. So what ha instead of that healing the emotions, instead of healing the underlying causal emotions, which remember are all associated generally with our childhood. So well, instead of healing it at that level, what we finish up doing 
is we start living in these emotions day by day. And then we start telling ourselves messages like, oh, that doesn't really matter to me very much. When if you allowed yourself to sit down for a moment and really breathe into it and ask yourself how much this matters that you're alone, you'd probably start crying straight away. Right? But because we don't allow that to happen anymore and we've got all these other fear-based programming going on, we don't feel that anymore. We feel that we don't feel it anymore because we've suppressed it so much. Now, what I'm suggesting to you today is that we need to, instead of ignoring these things that are within us, and instead of living in them, remember there are two different things that we have a tendency to do. The first thing we have a tendency to do is to ignore them completely. All right? So ignore our fears. The way we do that is we use our mind very cleverly. Every time we get a bit afraid, we just avoid that thing that makes us fearful. Case solved. That's how we feel. So we avoid this and we go along in life and, oh, there's another thing that looks a little bit like it's going to be a bit fearful, so I avoid that. And before you know it, you know, you're basically feeling like you don't have very much fear at all, but that's because you're avoiding quite a lot of things in your life. Does that make sense? So that's what we have a tendency to do, to ignore it completely. Or the next tendency we have is to live in it. What I mean by living in it is that we know we're afraid but we don't release the fear, we live by the fear instead. So, for example, a person who's afraid monetarily, they will live by the fear because what they will do is they'll not be generous. Does that make sense? So somebody, and it doesn't matter how much money they have, they still won't be generous. You know, they could have a million dollars in the bank but they're still not going to be generous <laughs> because they're still living in the fear of lack. So they walk into a shop and they want to barter with the person. They, there's something they really like, but they've got to knock them down five bucks, right? Then they feel like they've made, had a bargain, right? Mm -hmm. or, or they go along and buy a car and they've got to knock him down three or four grand and, and get, get the best deal out of it. And all of a sudden that particular emotion comes up again, you know, the, emo the fear that they have. They're living in this fear of their own lack of abundance. They don't believe if they really want something, they can just pay for it and whatever the money that they had will come back to them at some point. They don't believe any of that, you see. This happens a lot, right? I don't know, it's many of you still doing that, aren't you, in your life, right? That's why we go along to markets a lot, you know? Like the Yaman, you look at the Yamundi markets, it's like a world-renowned market. And, and a lot of the times we go along hoping to get the bargain. And we spend like four hours, and, and it's different if you enjoy the process, but some don't enjoy the process, but they go there for four hours instead, looking for this particular one thing, and it's not there that day, and they go, oh, well, I didn't get the bargain today, they'll go back next week. And if they add up four hours by, say, like $40 or $50 an hour that they might get working, then now this thing's costing two or $300, and they got it for $10, but it's now $210 that it's really cost them, <laughs> right, in terms of their time, and, and it comes from this emotion, this emotion of a lack of abundance, that I can't just go and get what I want, find it and get it. We have a lot of other emotions surrounding our fears as well, but most of the time we finish up living in them. So we live in them with regard to relationships, our fears in the relationship. So let's say if I have a fear that my wife's going to cheat on me all the time, right? I'm going to become very jealous and possessive. Can you see that? Because I, I want to keep an eye on her and watch what she's doing and who, which man she talks to and she, that man projected sexually at her and I, and I start getting really worried about that. And before I know it, my whole life is embroiled around protecting her and controlling her. This is the way I feel it. I don't feel it as control. I feel it as protection of, protection of our relationship. But in reality, it's just control and manipulation. That's what it ends up because I'm living in my fear. We can see that happen with regard to um, you know, when we go to work. Many of us still go to work jobs that we don't like. Right? Why do we do that? Because we're actually living in our fear. Our fear is, is if I stop that job, I won't get the kind of job that I really want. And the truth is, probably while you have that emotion, you won't get the job you really want. And if you release that emotionally, you will then probably get the job you really want. Right? And we also neglect in our fears all these aspects of prayer and desire and all these other things in the process of fear. Because our fear becomes so dominant that everything else 
means nothing to us. So, let's say I'm very afraid of your opinion. So I walk in a room and I've got a hundred people's opinion to cope with, right? And I'm very afraid of every single one of those person's opinion. What am I going to do with regard to truth? I'll modify a bit of truth for that person, a bit of truth for this person, a bit of truth for that person, but I won't say the particular truth that they really need that's going to trigger their anger because I want the emotion back of everyone liking me and everyone approving me, so I won't do any of that. Can you see how I'm now modifying my own behaviour to suit my own fear? And this happens all the time, doesn't it? You think of how many times you've done that in the last week where you've, somebody's asked you how you feel, you don't really tell them how you feel, you tell them a modified version of how you feel because if you tell them really how you feel, all sorts of things might happen, right? That's our fear at work. Our fear is at work in so many places. The problem with our fear and living in it is when we live in it, we don't even really notice what we're doing. And sometimes it needs somebody else to come up and say, hey, you know, if they, somebody loves you, they will do this. They'll say, hey, have you noticed the last week you did this five times and you've said to me you don't ever want to do that again, but every single time I noticed it was because of fear that you had. And then you can start discussing your fears and working your way through your fears. Everyone needs to be open about our fears. Now yesterday, during the presentation yesterday, it was so hard to present the fear-based material to you. It was really hard. The reason why was there was this sort of like a wall around your fear. And many of us do this. We, we, we prote protect our fear. We do it by shutting down, closing down, going to sleep, getting tired, getting angry or upset, or just tuning out, zoning out, thinking of something else. We do all sorts of things in order to just avoid getting into these really deep emotions that we have around surrounding our fear. So we don't want to do that either. So today what we've planned for you is a, a very ad hoc presentation of different things to help you get in tune with your fears. Right? And to try to help you begin the process of emotionally processing your fears. Now many of you are afraid to even let yourself shake. Because when you let yourself shake, what does it look like to everyone else now? <laughs> It looks like I've got, what is it? <laughs> Parkinson's disease, right? <laughs> Which, by the way, is a, a, a fear-based emotional disease, yeah? Right? So it looks like, and this is I start shaking as my body starts twitching and I you know, start going into these strange places and everyone around me starts feeling like, he's a bit strange, right? Lots of judgment comes at you and you see, that's also one of our fears is a huge fear the human race has of being judged by, the other, by another person. Because when you're judged, how does it feel? Like it feels that you're being made lesser than them. And the truth is that is the purpose of judgment, is to make you feel lesser than the other person. But if you think about it, I must have, if I look at my law of attraction, I must have a motion of unworthiness with that other person in the first place for them to actually feel that way towards me. Can you see that? So I need to work my way through that emotion. When I work my way through that emotion, every single around person around me, their opinion will not matter in the sense that I won't govern my life or my fears about those opinions. That's going to be pretty freeing, isn't it? Do you think? How free will you feel when you don't have to consider another person's fears in your own life? Because that's all they are when they're judging you, they're just fearing something within themselves, right? So most of the time, again, we're just living by people's fear, we're living by our fear, and all of this is due to addictions that we have. And we've talked a lot in the past about addictions, about emotional addictions. But we are often so addicted to getting something from someone else that we don't believe that these things can come either from within ourselves or from God directly. So that gets back to the two core emotional injuries we said yesterday, remember? The two core fear-based beliefs, which are, the first one was, I cannot cope with this emotionally, with this. I can't cope with this pain, I can't cope with this emotionally. And the second one was that I'm alone. There's no God, there's no anybody around to help me, I have to do it all myself. And everything gets back to those two. So what we're going to do today 
as I said yesterday, is present to you some things that might trigger some of your fears. All right. Now, Mary's made me calm down on what I probably would have done. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and that's probably because of her own fears. And we'll, so what she's going to do is come up first and share some of her fears. Um, but uh, um, because normally I would actually present things in a very confronting way regarding fear. And some of the things that are available to you to confront your fears are, you know, there's so much available to you now. Books, movies, on the internet. And in fact, when you think about it, most of the media is totally driven by your desire to live in your fear. Do you think, do you think a 30-minute news presentation of good news would actually work at the moment? Of course it wouldn't. Because nobody wants to hear the good news because they're afraid inside. They want to hear the things that I've got to be afraid of coming at them, you see. And so what we're really doing is we're creating that media by our own fear. Can you see that? By our own longing for bad news. And why do we long for bad news? Because we're so afraid of what happens when we hear bad news. We've got to avoid something. I've got to avoid all the pitfalls in life. That's what we often think and feel. And so we're going along our life doing that maze thing that I pointed out earlier that, that Mary said. Just the maze thing with our life, going around, going around, avoiding all these different pitfalls and fears. And oh, I've got to read the newspaper every day because if I don't read the newspaper every day, I won't know what to be afraid of today. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, that's really what it's about in most cases. We think of it, oh, I'm just finding out the news. No, you're not. You're finding out a grossly distorted misrepresentation of the news that has been put this flavour upon it by the world's media so that you can f continue in your fear. Because we've become addicted to, our own f to, to, to satisfying our own fears. So when you th think about it, even with regard to media, it's the same thing, isn't it? We're so addicted to getting these things. So um, some, I know some people just watch the news every night, like it's a religion really. Like people say this is a religion, but this is a religion. That's a religion. Every single night, 7 o'clock comes or 6.30 or 6 o'clock now, or now they have a whole hour news now, you know, like before, you know, like, like 20 years ago, there was no such thing as an hour news, was there? It was like half an hour news or, or, or if you're lucky, sometimes 15 minutes it started out being or even 10 minutes, just little bites, you know, like... That's all it was. But now there's these our news programs. And, and in fact, the news presenters are the most commonly recognised people in the state, generally, because, <laughs> because of their... Because they're on the screen so often, right? It's like everyone recognises them. And all of that is just driven by us living in our fear. And so I'm not suggesting today that w with this process over the next six weeks that you live in your fear. What I'm suggesting is that you actually delve down deeper and actually experience emotionally emotionally your fear. So, what does that mean to experience it emotionally? It means that you will work through your fear and come out the other end of it without having it. That's what it means. So if after six weeks of this pro little process that we're going through, or four weeks, or however long we're going, you're going to choose to do it yourself, you, you don't come out of your fear, then you are not emotionally experiencing your fear yet. All you're doing is staying and living in it. And that's not what I'm suggesting to do. And in fact, what you'll find, if you stay and live in it, you will probably get quite angry with me over the next six weeks. And many of you who stay and live in it, if you choose to stay and live in it, you won't come back again. <laughs> because you'll be so upset about your fears getting triggered. You see, whenever our fears get triggered and we want to deny them, what did we say yesterday? We go straight into deny. anger into the anger, the denial of anger. So I'm not suggesting you do that. What I'm suggesting is that you experience emotionally the fear. That will also mean experiencing it bodily. Right. 
Now, yesterday I described what that felt like for me. Um, when Mary's up, maybe she could describe a little what it's felt like for her recently. And what we can do is just talk about what you may go through. And the key is during this whole process is to realise that you are safe, everything is going to be right, if you just keep processing it emotionally. <laughs> Everything's not going to be all right if you just live in it, trust me. What's going to happen if you just live in it is you're going to attract even more events that are fearful in your life than you're attracting already. So that's the choice you have to make. There's a choice here. The choice is, do I start this at all or do I really do it properly? <laughs> that's really the choice. Because you don't want to do it half-heartedly. You stay at half-heartedly and you live in it and you'll find your life will have some pretty harsh things happen in the next six weeks. So I'm not suggesting you do that either. I'm suggesting you use the tools you've already been given over the last year and a half to actually get into and process emotionally the experience of fear. All right. Perhaps, Mary, if you could come up and we could just talk a little bit about what your experience has been about for you. Yeah. So when we process these fears, we're just processing the fear. We're not going down underneath that, the grief or whatever is underneath it? Well, the fear is because of the grief. So you will find when you process the fear, what will happen is you'll probably do a lot of bodily things and all of these kind of things and you breathe and you feel yourself breathe, trying to breathe and you feel all locked up and you may actually even go into a fetal position even with your fear and then eventually you'll break through that into the grief that's underlying it. So many of you may find yourself getting into the grief that underlies the fear, certainly. Sarah? Uh, I just want to say I've found recently when I've been processing, I've done the both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I've been crying and then like my teeth are chattering yeah. and I'm shaking and then crying some more. And that's right. Yeah, it's like a combination. And that's what it's often like. Yeah. The key is to not try to intellectualise this process very much. If you allow the emotional experience, you, your body knows and your soul knows exactly what to experience. The key is just to go ahead with that experience and go through it rather than living in it. When you go through it, you come out the other end, you feel a sense of peace generally. So, so that's a good indication of whether you've actually dealt with the emotion or not fully. If you're not feeling a sense of peace and you're still in agitation, then there's either more to it or you're actually not dealing with the true emotion. There's, you're just living in the emotion. So that's something to be aware of. Um, so when you, when you started doing it, um, did I just... Just... Sorry, can the air conditioner be a bit warmer? Is that, is that what you're asking? Is it a bit cold? Yeah, so maybe if we can make it a bit warmer. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. All right. I found the difference when I um, started to feel about my emotions, or to try and connect emotionally with myself, yep. uh, was... When I started to recognise that I was in fear, um, I would say, okay, I'm afraid, and just try and sit with that. But eventually I got to feel um, the difference between when I was resisting the fear and when I, w I really had to take the step to let it overwhelm me, to just um, sort of surrender to the fear. Mm. And um, what happened when you did that? Various things. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I shake quite a bit. I just go and lie down and um, I have I experience sort of full body shaking and trembling. And like Sarah, sometimes I, I go into tears and then I'm crying again and then tears. Because I find that as I'm processing the fear, immediately the emotion that it's capping starts to come up. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you've gone into a real sort of almost childlike state with it, haven't you? And I've picked Mary up and taken her to bed and just, and just put her in bed and put the covers over because she's shaking with cold even though it's hot. And that's a good indication. If, if, you're, if you're shaking with cold even though it's hot, then obviously there's some fear, fear stuff coming up for you there. Many of you feel addicted to uh, having hot drinks still. And, and that's a good indication that that particular moment there's a fear that you're usually shutting down. That was definitely the case with me. I would drink um, three or four cups of herbal tea a day 
uh, and I went through a period of, pro I can't remember what the fear was at the moment, but I, I processed one big hunk of fear and I hardly drink mm. hot drinks anymore. And if I notice myself wanting one, I noticed I wanted one this morning mm -hmm. um, because I'm feeling quite fearful about today, then I immediately can um, try and connect with what it is I'm avoiding. Yeah. Yeah. So does everyone else sort of understand like the, the, fear, the processing of it, if you like? It's not going to be the same, it's not going to be an intellectual process for you. Sometimes it is just tears for me though as well. Sometimes it's just sobbing in fear. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, do we have a question? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you said you noticed some fear is coming up because you drank uh, or you felt you wanted a herbal tea, did you then actually drink it this morning? No. no. So not drinking it helps the fear getting up. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Thank that's you. So that helps the processing because right now I don't know what processing is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't. I think, what are they doing? <laughs> what am I <laughs> missing here? No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Perhaps uh, if we could illustrate a little of what you felt this morning and then wanting to go for the drink, which was, you know, it sounds like she's going for the alcohol, but it's not actually <laughs> like that. <laughs> In the past it might have been like that. But, <laughs> but uh, and, then, and then maybe... Um, what you actually chose to do instead and then yep. and you're still staying in it now so if you could describe some of the fears that you were feeling when we got yep. up this morning uh, so I've been very afraid about uh, AJ doing this presentation because uh, in my experience when people are very afraid uh, they get angry and that was my uh, experience as well um, when I met AJ I got very afraid and I got very angry at him <laughs> so so I sort of felt like I knew what I was uh, talking about. Mm. Uh, and I'm very afraid of people attacking us and, and being angry at us. I'm very afraid of judgment. Um, and I'm also really triggered because we're in this bigger venue and there's more people coming. And, and so it's like a double whammy of fears this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and because there's some new people here as well. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so one of the things you're afraid is that the ones that are new will judge everything based on this weekend yeah. uh, rather, than, rather than actually look at all of the information that's been presented. So, so what, what's the fear in that? Is that when you started tracing it back this morning? Uh, I got to two... So what happened was I was feeling quite anxious this morning and uh, I wanted to... Um, I wanted to eat, I wanted to have a hot drink, uh, I was pacing around, AJ was busy and, um, and then I realised I was, I was feeling quite fearful. So I just went and lay down and tried to let myself connect with what was going on and I, and I was trembling a bit and feeling quite cold. Um, and wh what I sort of just let myself feel, okay, what, I'm, what am I afraid of? Just let it come. So I'm afraid of this big place, I'm afraid of these people, I'm afraid. And I got down to basically, I'm afraid that we'll be attacked and that we'll be alone, pretty much. Mm. Um, or that, yeah, rather than people uh, just leaving us alone, that we'll be actively attacked. Yeah. yeah. So there's been times in the past even already where, where somebody just doesn't leave, it, leave us be, you know, like, like you'd think if you had your own belief and I had my own belief that we could basically just leave each other be. I'm happy for you to have your belief. And, but it seems that a lot of people are not very happy about me having my belief. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's been a fairly large source of uh, attack that's come towards us is obviously people hear these things and then they go down the line of not wanting us to have the belief we have. And, uh, and then they go into lots of judgment and lots of, and lots of rage even. So we've got some really nasty, uh, violent emails in particular, you know, swearing and cursing us and so forth. And um, uh, all just because of somebody can't let us have our own belief. Um, well, and that's my law of attraction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I have this huge fear. Yeah. yeah. So um, oftentimes too, Mary finds that you basically get cold, don't you? So it's a... Like we can be in the same place, and all of a sudden you'll just go into this cold place, uh, physically cold. Cold, feeling all queasy, or butterflies in the tummy, 
shaking. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good at, or I used to be really good at avoidance of using different things to get out of it. So the drinking, the hot drinks, the um, distracting myself with different things. And it's only been since I started to um, be a bit more vigilant with my own, what's happening internally, that I feel now more physical symptoms, like I, I've got really cold hands and uh, I get quite pale and I feel shaky, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. When I was going through it myself, I used to get uh, so cold that I used to be a computer uh, programmer and I used to sit at my desk with a heater on and I'd get a sleeping bag and I'd actually put the sleeping bag on me, like so I'd get in the sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> And fortunately, all the offices that I've ever had, I owned, so that was fine. So I get it in the sleeping bag, and I would just sit there with my hands out, and I'd put these like gloves on with, you know, with the fingers out, and I'd be there like that, and I would still get cold, right? And uh, and I'd be there, and after I get so cold that I'd have to move around a bit, and it didn't matter what temperature the day was, I'd still have cold hands and cold feet. Cold hands and cold feet, by the way, very good sign there's quite a lot of fear to work your way through. Uh -huh. and, and I would say for us, those things that we're the feeling queasy, the feeling pale, the feeling cold, we're, or we're triggered on the fear but we're not processing it yet. We can actually live in that place for yeah. quite a while and that's not the same as processing it. Yeah. That's more just your indication that there's that you're fear to that you feel. Have fear. Yeah, because yeah. what I found is I lived in that place for a, a lot of years. Like, so for seven or eight years, that's how I'd program, like in a sleeping bag. Um, you, you could have done some kind of cross-marketing with camping stores or something. Could have, yeah, yeah. yeah I was thinking about it. <laughs> it was quite funny because uh, uh, people would come to visit me at times and they'd go, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> oh, just a bit cold on the hands and feet. Yeah, and, and, and no matter what I did, I just couldn't get warm, you know? So you know what it's like sometimes where you just feel like you just can't get warm no matter what you do? Well, that's a good indication there's a fair level of fear within you to work your way through. So if you can allow yourself to see that. The physical symptoms of fear very much are cold. Cold, obviously, is one of the physical symptoms of fear. Your body has the ability to regulate its temperature very in, in a large range. And yet, for the majority of us, that range is severely reduced by the fears that we're experiencing, or I should say, not experiencing, and actually living in. So if you find your body is very sensitive to temperature, hot or cold, then, they, then they're usually, if it's sem sensitive to hot temperatures, it's about anger and shame. If it's sensitive to cold temperatures, it's about terror and fear. All right, so if they are just general indications of what will happen in your body. I just wanted to ask, sometimes when I'm really relaxed, like almost about to sleep, like my leg will just start to shake yep. uncontrollably? Is that yep. the fear coming up? Yes, what will happen to your body at different times if you allow your processing of fear, you'll find your legs will do and arms will do all sorts of things. And I've had my jaw even doing the same, you know, you know, you know like that by, you yeah, know, by mine itself. Yeah, does that now too. <laughs> and, uh, and all of those things, though, and that's all part of that release of that terror and, uh, and fear. So the key is to not judge these things happening in your body. These are necessary parts of the release. And you need to just allow them to occur and breathe and keep your breathing, diaphragmatic breathing happening, because that's going to allow yourself to experience those particular sensations. Thanks. Uh, you need to put the mic right up, the on button, the on button, I mean. Yeah. Um, what about screaming as an expression of fear? Uh, screaming is, uh, is also very good as an expression of fear. Usually it's a combination of fear and rage but it's a very good way to actually connect with a lot of your fears too. Um, of course, sometimes it's very hard to get into that emotionally when you're triggered, um, and unless somebody frightens you. And I, I don't, I'm not suggesting here that you basically re-traumatise you know, yourself with even more fear. So, so sometimes it's very, very hard to get into that. If you find yourself triggered and scream, let yourself continue the fear process straight after you've screamed. Does that make sense to everyone? Like, 
So, so let's say somebody surprises you and you go, <gasps> you know, and th now th there's an opportunity there, you see, to connect to what's underneath that. And so go, go into that opportunity straight away. But yes, scream, you'll have many physical expressions and voice is one of them. And um, terror, by the way, is very, very different to fear in that terror often causes you to freeze up completely. Um, whereas fear, you will often have a flight or a fight response, right? So the key is when you, whenever you feel like fleeing a situation, so let's say you walk into a supermarket and you just feel creeped out and you feel like you've got to walk out again, there's fear being tested there. So st my suggestion would be stay in the supermarket and let that fear come up. What, what is this fear about? You know, allow myself, I allow myself to feel my fear, allow yourself to experience it. Um, there are other situations you get angry about. We've already talked about anger. So every time you get angry or annoyed or upset or any of those kind of things, there's fear usually in those particular expressions as well. Does that make sense? So whenever you notice yourself angry or trying to run away, that's fear. Whenever you find yourself getting to this place where you freeze up, that's terror. And you could say terror is the pinnacle of fear, but terror also needs to be released. And the only way you can release it, like most others, is breathe your way through it and allow yourself to stay in the state. Now, there's been times in my life where I've stayed in that state for two or three or four hours at a time, and I've just allowed myself to breathe through that process. Now, of course, that's a bit hard if it's been triggered at work or something. You're not going to be very productive for three or four hours. So obviously, you're going to have to work through that particular stuff about your work situation and so forth. But the, the idea is to connect with this terror if you have it and feel it. All terror-based experiences are usually uh, uh, childhood referred from parents, in other words, multi-generational injuries from parents who have experienced terror, or terror that's occurred in your own childhood. And those, terror, those terrifying events can be anything from your mum and dad screaming at you when you picked up a spider, and them terrifying you more than the spider did, or right the way through to physical violence, and most of us when we were little had some kind of physical violence from our parents, and or right the way through to things like being uh, you know, se sexually or physically abused. And, they, and if you've had those things in your past, then there's terror probably to deal with in, your, in yourself as well. If we go come to Raya and then up. Lately, um, I've had this incredible um, extreme irritable response to any kind of loud noises. Mm -hmm. Kids screaming. Uh, we were near a restaurant this morning over in Noosa and it was just like more than I could handle the mm -hmm. noise of all these people. That's fair too? Yes, so what I would do in that situation is stay where the noise is there and just allow yourself to be overwhelmed by your own emotion. And do it there? Do it there, yeah. Yeah. Right in front of but a, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the issue, you see. That that's is. the block. The yeah. block is, do I do it right in front of the other people? Yes, that's, uh, I, I feel yes, because you, this is the situation that's triggering it. Yeah. So, so stay in the situation that's triggering it. The alternative is you can go home and put on a stereo full bore with terrible music that you hate and do it that way if you want, or tape record all these children running around and replay that over and over and over at your home. But there are other alternatives, but... But if something comes up when you're in the situation, the best time for you to access it emotionally is in that situation. You might be reading about me in the newspaper. That's, that's fine. <laughs> the, key, the key is you won't, you won't ever get into anger and ha harm of others. So the only time that anybody will read about you in a newspaper is that you cried at one of the shops, you know, okay. and, and that often happens anyway. So, you know, and if you have a fear-based response, you, you've got usually someone with you who knows about that. So. But yes, Ray, there will be some, some of those kind of things. You can, of course, plan for some of these things. So you could actually, you know now that actually having children running around making lots of noise causes lots of like yeah. a a anger in you, yeah. so, which is actually covering over some yeah. fear yeah. about the noisy situation. So what I would do then is go to a very noisy situation with a recording device, record it all, right, and, and then go home with that or, you know, and play it over and over until you connect with what the emotion is. Okay. Do you know what the emotion is? Um, no, I don't. I'm just extremely irritated by the sound mm -hmm. and it's coming up more and more. So something is about ready to break. I can okay. feel it. You think it's about feeling unloved, right? Feeling what? Unloved. I don't know. That could be. Yeah. I feel pretty loved right now, but it could be more, you know. Yeah. So I'll see, but it, it's just been a lot. Huh? Use the mic, man. 
Well, you could say that. Mary wants to solve everyone's problems. There, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's what we love about Mary. She knows me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell me. Mic, Use the mic. <laughs> I'm not the only one in here. Um, I was just uh, wanting to not talk about all your stuff in public, and then I started doing it right. But, uh, <laughs> um, I have no secrets anymore, man. Yeah, yeah. None of us do. I was just wondering um, if it's an emotion for you about. I, I know you have some stuff sometimes about when people in general public situations aren't respecting your space or your time or that kind of thing and I wondered if rather than a, a terror based sort of a fear it was just this fear of feeling uh, I, I'm not respected and I'm not loved. I'll go with that and yeah. see if that could be it. Yeah, yeah thanks Mary. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And there was... <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, it's the start of the day. What was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a competition between the oh, mic handlers at the moment. I'm suddenly really frightened. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke last time and I wasn't frightened, but I'm really frightened now. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right, go with that. That's all right. I actually went to your last session, mm -hmm. only the one. Yeah. Oh, what am I going to say? <laughs> 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 I've done a lot of emotional release, but I went through the most massive emotional release after your talk in... Brisbane. Wherever it was, Brisbane. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> It was definitely the fear. It was actually Brian suggested something to me. Yeah. I, I've never been through so much fear and anger and screaming. And I straight away went into my childhood rage over my father. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, I'm really going around in circles here. I don't think what you say is the truth. I think at the end of the process is the truth. Because when I went through that three days of so much intense emotion and at one stage I thought I'm going to have a mental breakdown and I'm going to blame you. Mm -hmm. I yeah. better ring the doctor. Yeah. At the end of it, you know, I just felt like a child and I thought, oh, this is the truth. That's it. This is the, tr I mean, there's still more, but yeah. this is the truth. That's it. But I was really frightened at the end. I thought, I, oh, it's been so intense. Yeah. But I really wonder if you going back to that core original emotion, mm -hmm. the terror and stuff, uh -huh. is that automatically going to heal the damage that's been done in subsequent relationships with men? Because I've got a feeling it does as well. It surely does. Yeah. Yep. The reason why all the subsequent relationships with men were caused by this relationship with your father and uh, the interaction that went on there and the damage and the terror and all the other emotions that went on with your father. And so that's the beginning of your law of attraction. And so, yes, if you heal that particular emotion, which is the most difficult emotion to heal, and as you've just related, the experience you had is the kind of experience as many people here need to have. The, the outcome is, uh, when you finish it, you realise what it's all about. What, in fact, you, even your life's been all about in many cases. And you can see it all traces back to those really core relationships. And the key is just to allow the process to occur, because. In between the beginning of the process and the end, you'll think lots of different things. You'll think lots of different angry things and lots of different sad things and lots of different you know, fear-based things will come up as well. But when you get to the end of it, that's when you start real When you start, you, you'll find that the, the truth of your life starts sort of, you start feeling the truth of your life in this. And when that happens, that's a good indication you're starting to really get at some core emotions, some causal emotions. My trap is now I'm projecting onto my partner. You're not doing your yes. thing. <laughs> I realised that when you were talking, I thought I'm starting to project on him. Yeah. But that's actually mine. That's right. So that's another facet, if you like, of this relationship with Dad. You know? so, so it's another facet of what's going on there. Um, so if you can allow yourself to realise that every time you want somebody else to deal with the same thing you've just dealt with, that's because there's still something left within you that causes you to be in that state. And so you, there's still some more there to go. But understand that what you've just, uh, what's your name again, sorry? Ma Mary. Mary. <laughs> Ma what Mary has just related is actually what many of you may experience. And you'll go through all of these different uh, feelings and emotions and many of you will curse the day you met me and all these kind of things in the process, right? When you come out the other end of it, 
that's when you start realising that you needed to do that to get through this. And one of the other things that's really important to understand too is that you often need to do these processes alone. And the reason why you often need to do it alone is because we don't have a belief that we can cope with everything alone. And we need to challenge that fear, you see. And the truth is that all of us have been made in such a way that we can actually deal with all of our emotions without needing someone else around me to nurse me through the process, right? So, so while going to a therapist might be a good thing to get you going and while going to other people might get, you know, like some kind of healers might get you, be a good thing to get you going, in the end you will eventually get to the point where you're confident in dealing with all of these really deep emotions by yourself. And when I say by yourself, just between yourself and your relationship with God. And that's when you really start getting into the real core of everything. Right? Up until then, you're still really projecting that, oh, I need someone else's help to do it, if that makes sense. But what you've described, Mary, is a very, that's a very good description of what many may experience. I've had those experiences. Um, if we go back there, and then Ken, Ken, if you go over there. Um, AJ, I've been having a lot of cramping during the night yep. over the last little while. Yep. And I'm wondering if that, and I have been feeling a lot of fear yep. around speaking the truth. And I've been doing it more, but I'm still, that fear is still really strong. So is the cramping connected to that? Because it's happening a lot at night. Yes, it certainly is connected to that. Um, you will need to allow... you. There's, a, there's an issue though in that if your cramping is continuing all the time or, or regularly, then obviously there's a part of this fear that's not yet being dealt with. So mm -hmm. I know it's difficult when you're in a cramp because you're in so much physical pain that often you know everything else sort of pales into significance. But if you can just allow yourself to ask yourself the question, what is this emotional? What is this emotionally? And you'll feel some, but because a part of a cramp is a painful situation that you're actually now tied into through your body. Does that make sense? Like your body now is forcing yeah. you to not move. Absolutely. And, and so there's something in that emotionally for you with regard to your fear and uh, you know, feeling like you can't move. And that's probably as much as I'd like to say because I think you know how to get into that emotional pretty well. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely a childhood thing. Very much Where so. I would go fetal. Yes. Yeah. So you need to allow yourself to actually feel that emotion in you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it does. Thank yeah. you, Aja. Yeah. Uh, two days ago, before I came down to the seminar, um, I had this dream in the morning. I woke up at the dream. I'm in hell. Yeah. It was. I, I felt I'm in hell, and I felt so much fear coming up. Mm -hmm. So I got up and uh, shared it with my partner, and um, I just felt hell. Hell also is if if you close down your emotions, if you close down your heart. Yeah. This is a lot of fear, and um, and then I started to cry, and I screamed, and yeah. that fear of closing down my emotions and my feelings yep. and closing my heart. Yep. This is hell. Yep. This is living in, in hell. That's right. So, I mean, my indication for fear is a lot. My heart just sometimes goes like this. Much more higher than your average yeah, heart rate. I feel, I yeah. feel that very much. Sometimes the people describe it as your heart being in your throat, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's also a good indication. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. I'd just like to share that. That's good. What's hell is for me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, what we'll do, um, we'll, if we can have the mic over here, Miss James. AJ, is breathing sufficient enough to release some emotions? As long as you're diaphragmatically breathing, yes. Um, but you, if you're f experiencing fear and terror, you will certainly have other, other bodily symptoms other than just being, be, being able to breathe. Um, so my suggestion is but all, ought to always try to breathe no matter mm. what 
uh, emotion you're experiencing, even if it's sadness or grief or any other emotion, shame. Mm -hmm. Breathing is a very powerful way. Breathing also, diaphragmatic breathing does a lot for you as well in your body uh, because it uh, is your main, your body's main source of sustenance actually. Your breathing is actually, yes. many people are not aware of that, but the truth is that how you breathe mm. is, is, is ma far more important than what you eat yes. <laughs> even. Uh, unless of course what you eat is unloving to your environment. But what you, how you breathe is very, very important. And that's why it's such an essential thing to continue to do. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. For every emotion. Jen, thanks. Um, I'm really fearful today and um, came with a sense of exuberance, the exact opposite. Yep. And, and sitting here realising the difference between the complete, the, ma the manic condition yeah. of um, denial of fear, den denial of, I'm sorry, it's hard for me okay. to say it simply. Yeah. My question is about happiness at the end of it. I don't truly know what happiness is because I go from this manic manifestation of the denial of the fear yep. and the complete opposite which is in, so in the fear complete itself. surrender to the fear where I'm in so much pain I don't think it's ever going to end. Mm -hmm. None of those extreme states are a state of happiness. Is there happiness at the end of it? so that you understand what it really is? Yeah, well I suppose the thing, the thing is that most of you often have commented to me about how happy I'm mo I am most of the time, right? And the only way that I've become the way I am is by dealing with all of these emotions, to deal with all this grief and all this fear and I've had lots and lots of it to deal with. So my, I can say categorically to you that you'll definitely come out of it if you process the fear and don't live in it. What you say is that what you raise though is a very good point and that is that there are two extremes to our fear processing that we may experience. One is like a manic, a manic laughter and the other is like a really you know, terrified place. And the truth is that often we need to go through the experience of both of those extremes when we are experiencing our fears. The key is to ask yourself whether you're using the laughter to avoid or whether, you're using, where, whether it is a childhood expression. Because in the end, all of our fear is usually from our childhood. So it will be childlike in the way it's expressed. And this is where a lot of men who think they're not afraid use a lot of jokes in their life. Yeah. And you'll see that happening quite a lot. Now, often those men are full of fear but are using jokes or in adult intellectual joy, if you like, to cover over their fears. When you're though in this manic phase where, where you're laughing and you're feeling afraid, sometimes it's actually a feeling of excitement. And what happens when we have fear in us is we cannot differentiate between excitement and fear. Now many of you currently are in that state where you can't actually easily identify what it means to be excited compared with what it means to be afraid. Now I had this problem terribly, like I, every time I'd get slightly excited about something I always felt that I was afraid <laughs> and vice versa. If I got afraid I'd think that I was excited but really I was terrified. And it took me processing through my fears to actually start to realise the difference between those two states. It's, you'll find that excitement is a very similar emotion to fear in, the, in, in its physiological response inside of you. And, and it often kicks off very similar chemical reactions inside of you as well. So the soul through its emotion experiences many chemical responses that are very similar. And so it's often very difficult to determine the difference between excitement and fear. So are you saying when you, when I feel afraid I often feel a sense of dread? When you were excited you felt dread? I felt dread, oh. yeah. Yeah, so it was really strange. I, like I, I would feel excited but then I'd feel dread like what's going to happen next and there was a combination of my fear and my excitement and because of very, very similar emotions 
physiologically you'd feel them in a very similar way. The heart starts, you know, when you're excited, the heart beats faster too when you're excited, doesn't it? And all of those kind of things start happening and, and so you start to not be able to tell the difference between those two sets of emotions. But you will need to experience often both fluctuations, the manic sort of laughter, right, which is a very childlike state, right down to the, the fear and terror in, in a childlike state to, and, and allow yourself to go through it. If you're in pain with it, then often it's because you're still not getting to the bottom of it. So that's the thing to just, oh, whenever I'm in pain, I just pray to God a lot about the pain and I say to God, I know that I'm in denial of something here. I'd love to know what it is, you know. I'd love to know what it is even intellectually to work out and then, and then maybe I can work through it emotionally. Thank you. Yeah. My manic also manifests in busyness. Yes. If I sit still, I find I trigger fear re much more readily. The busier that I am, um, I just like stay. The manic keeps me busy. Yeah. Busy in physically, but busy in my head too. The other issue that many face, and that you face, Jen, is that because you're spirit influence and you've got you know fairly open mediumistic uh, abilities. What happens is that spirits around you in certain states can easily be attracted as soon as there's any denial in your own state. So as soon as, as soon as you feel some pain, you know you're in denial of your own state, but at that point many spirits can come around you and go whoosh around you and sometimes you'll feel them like that and then you'll go into like a manic laughter and sometimes that's actually expressing their, their method of getting out of their fear. Does that make sense? And so the key is to every time you feel pain and every time you feel like you're getting out of the causal emotion, just I, all I do is just long for God's love to just s protect me through this next process, if you like. And, and most of the time, um, you know, you, you, you can work your way through things quite rapidly like that. Sometimes though, recently I've noticed that when spirits have been attracted to me when I'm working through an emotion, that it's actually helped me work through the emotion even more. By, by their emotion heightening my own emotion and I just allow that to occur whereas most people who would talk to you about mediumship and, and those kind of things would say to surround yourself with some kind of protection barrier. My feelings are that actually nowadays I'm finding having spirits connected with me dealing with certain emotions has actually helped me get even more into that emotion and in, in the end helped me connect with the underlying causal emotion much easier. So the key again is to not be afraid that spirits are going to surround you and this is why today we're going to deal with that fear as well. Yeah, so. You want to say? I was just going to say for Jen that, that it may not be that it's that she's had an experience when she's younger that where something has happened when you've been quite still and that's what, and so it's not really the fear of the spirits anymore, it's just the, that causal emotion. Yeah, the fear of experiencing that causal emotion. Then we'll go. Okay, there's a mic up there already. Yep, yeah, go. I got it. <laughs> go um, I'm having a, a, I'm really in terror about um, actually falling unconscious. Right. Because um, I had a rape experience. Uh, yeah. When I was really young and I fell unconscious. Yes. Uh, so now for me to really, uh, I always, I'm afraid that I fall unconscious. Yes. And that uh, in the unconscious state is no protection. Right. Can I explain to you what actually happened in that childhood experience that you've had? Yes, please. Um, what often happens, um, and I'll just draw this so you can see it in terms of, hopefully you can see from there. Um, imagine this is uh, yourself. So here's yourself when you were younger. And by the way, this also applies if a person's had childhood abuse as well. So all childhood abuse, this usually applies. You've got the adult who is the perpetrator with you. The adult who's the perpetrator is often surrounded, and this hopefully will f connect you with some of your fears, is often surrounded with other spirit adult perpetrators, right? So there's a connection between that the emotional connection between these spirit adult perpetrators and this adult perpetrator. When that person rapes or harms this person, and this applies to rape as well as to abuse, often what happens is your spirit guides take you out of body. Right? 
in order to try to help you to, to cope with the experience emotionally. And what they often do, and many, this is why many uh, people who have been abused as children or who have been raped, experience in the, uh, uh, going either unconscious or going into a state uh, where they're now like in a pr some kind of pristine location, like a, like a paradise almost location, while the abuse is actually occurring. And the reason why they do that is that there's nothing else they can do, the spirits I mean, to, to help you through the process except for that. Now many, many of the abuse victims or, uh, and, and rape victims then become very afraid of that might happening again when in actual fact it was done to protect you in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. And, and I did have, as a smaller child, when I watched abuse to my mother, a yep. violation being hit that I, uh, I went to this place. I was, Spot on. I was always sitting somewhere in this light body. That's right. And, uh, and this is why many um, abuse victims also have strong mediumistic connections because that was established at a very young age as a method of protection against perpetrators. So, so um, the key for many, I find that many uh, rape victims and abuse victims have, ex have had that experience and then they become afraid of that happening during an emotional process. Yes, the truth is if that happens during the emotional process, if you go out of body, in the emotional process, it's not going to actually harm you so much, but uh, it does actually detune you from some of the causal emotion. So you can ask your guides to help you stay in a conscious state while you're experiencing the causal emotion that you're experiencing. And the beauty of what they've done too means that the, Im the amount of causal emotion to experience lessens. Because what's happened is that things were done to your body, but you weren't physically connected from your spirit body and your soul, which is the soul, this is all soul processing that we're doing, right? And your, at the soul layer, you're not actually very physically connected to your body during the abuse experience in many cases. So it's not always the case, but in many cases, particularly if it began when you were young. So it's a mechanism that your guides and your guardians have to actually nurse you through the process. All right. Now, if you allow yourself to think about that, you'll probably also become consciously aware of who those particular guides and guardians were. All right. And when that happens, you'll see that you can trust them and that they are many times still with you, helping you through the process of you know, triggering the emotions that were triggered right back in the beginning and helping you experience them. And uh, many, many abuse victims have actually described that experience uh, to us and, and not really known what's happened. Also, many abuse victims have described the process of seeing these perpetrators, the spirit perpetrators yeah, I did, I of their, the violence towards themselves. And that, for that reason, they've become very afraid of dealing with anything to do with spirits. That's right. But don't forget, you went out of body and there was all these other spirits around you who were actually in a very good state yeah. and they were also looking after you. And so you can, see, you can see again, it's just like on earth, there are some people who are not very nice conditioned and there's some people who are in good condition. And obviously if we spend more time releasing our emotions to get into a good condition ourselves with regard to love, then we attract more and more of those spirits who are in that good condition. So one of the things that happens quite often with regard to abuse survivors is that we finish up focusing so much on that dynamic of what's going on that we become terrified to even deal with the emotions of abuse. When in reality what we've got is a large, usually quite a few spirits around us who have been with us from a very young age who are trying to assist us to work our way through those terrible emotions that we experience. I mean I did a lot and a lot and a lot of rebirthing and I'm a rebirther myself but yeah. I still feel that there's something there what I just didn't get in all this time and also the fear what I call the astral plane. I don't know how you explain that but there was this Okay, I know my protecting spirits, but the dark spirits always said, my God, I'm also through this having access to the lower astral plane and where I often went in my dream state. Yeah. That just caused so much fear in my life and terror. You know, I, I'm really, that's the most afraid place, you see. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, again, it's the fear that causes the attraction of the spirits that you see sometimes in what you call the lower astral plane. That's just the spirit world, but what's actually happening is sometimes your fear when you're in a sleep or dream state, your fear is actually attracting you to 
the locations in the spirit world that are lower in their state. And what happens then, of course, is for the triggering of your fear, if you like. Now, my suggestion is that these spirits here who are your guides, if you connect more to them, and you can connect to them quite easily, if you connect more to them and trust them through the process, they know everything that happened to you and they will actually be, help, be able to help you with actually helping you with memories and pictures and emotions and everything if you're willing to deal with the fear of what happened. And, and if you can release this fear, you will also no longer attract a whole group of spirits who are in that dark place that you sometimes are afraid of attracting. So the key with all of this is working still through this fear that's, it, that's there. Thank, thank you so much. No worries, it's my pleasure. Um, I was shaking while she was talking the whole time. Mm -hmm. So now I'm shaking. <laughs> yeah. um, because when I was a little girl, I just remember, I don't remember much about my childhood, just being lonely, but I always remember when I tried to look back into my childhood, I remember it as a really happy experience, yeah. but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that explains a lot. Yeah. But... Um, when I first heard one of your CDs about spirits, um, I used to drink a lot as a teenager, mm -hmm. really abusively, and I haven't drunk for a long time. And I was walking past a bottle shop shopping my vegetables, <laughs> and I heard this voice, mmm, wouldn't that be nice, a little bowl of wine. Mm. <laughs> and I thought, where did that come from? And that was my first experience of actually listening, hearing, like I always hear voices, yeah. but never, mm, whatever. Yeah. But actually um, connecting... Connecting it that as that a, was somebody else trying spirit. to influence me to go into the and but nothing inside my body wanted any wine. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was um, really. But when you say nothing inside your body wanted any wine. Oh well, obviously. <laughs> there was actually an emotion that you were experiencing at the time that would have that they felt they could influence in. Yeah, making and it was. Um, if I look back, I think it was something that I was missing out on something. Yes. That yeah. I, I'm. Yeah. You're missing out on fun. fun. Yeah, 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 boring. Good on you. That's good. <laughs> yeah. so, you, so that's an emotion you need to allow yourself to work your way through, that yeah. you're missing out. How many of you have that emotion, that if you oh, follow sorry. this divine path, you're missing out on lots of things? Yeah? Lots of people will be yeah. joining you with that emotion. Yeah, I have it <laughs> chronic. <laughs> yeah. So it must be something else drawing you then, if that's the way you feel. Uh, Millie, thanks. You won. <laughs> um, uh, experience that I've had is like a spirit actually, like not the human involvement but the spirit. Um, like as a child I saw the spirits actually going to my sister and brother yeah. and molesting them yeah. and then the spirit just sort of coming to me and saying just you wait. But then I don't really have a memory of what happened to me, yeah. but just um, uh, the, the letting go of the terror of the whatever they did to me. Yeah. And um, I just, the question in my, that's sort of come up for me to ask is, um, the, do the spirits like come to your physical body or to your um, spirit body um, and does your, you know, if so, does your, do you go somewhere else as well? Well, it depends on the situation, Millie, as to what actually does occur. A lot of the times the spirits are in very dark places and a child's spirit body is actually in a much brighter place. So if you could think of that from a condition point of view, so if we just uh, draw a diagram again of the spirit world, if you like, in terms of the spheres. So here's the first sphere. The, the hells, remember, are in the bottom end of the first sphere, and it's only spirits who are in the hells who would ever consider doing these things to children, right? So you could say the hells, which is sort of dark places in the spirit world where there's very little love and where people haven't yet worked through all of their error, they're still, in fact, creating error, many of them. So they're in the hells of the first sphere, if you like. So this is the top of the first sphere is summer land, right? Uh, now, when a child is in a sleep state, the child is usually able to go to summer land, right? But these spirits can't get to summer land. 
So the only way often that the spirits can actually affect the child and cause ch the child to go into a states of fear is while the child is in a semi-sleep state or a dream-like state on earth, the spirits can also can surround them on earth because earth is a part of, the, you could think of it as it, any, any sphere is available to the earth. So oftentimes, although you could have uh, sexually damaging experiences in the spirit world, most of the time with, with, uh, with these kind of events, you've got the spirit who's in a very poor condition, much poorer condition than the, than the child, and uh, is, is being attracted to the child because of the parent's emotions, so the lack of protection emotions coming from the parent. So if the parents were full of divine love, you wouldn't have this problem at all because the, the spirits couldn't even surround their children doing this. So what happens is that the parents are obviously got fears that they are not working their way through. That means the child is usually born in fear uh, in the sense that the child now has all these different fears. A lot of them are sexual fears like you know your mother has and then your father had a lot of sexual abuse uh, type emotions to work through. And not I used to chuck up all the time as a baby as well. Yeah, that's right. So, so the child itself is now in this state where it's surrounded by parent, one parent with a lot of fear about sexual matters, another peer, parent with a lot of abuse things to do, do, do with sexual matters, and of course that's multi-generational. Mm. Um, and then you've got the child coming up in that environment, and so now the child has got fear stuff and the other side, the other gender stuff as well to work through. And the child is not in a conscious state of being able to work through those particular things. So that then opens them up to having this spirit, this negative spirit influence. And because they're on earth, the spirits can get to them quite easily. If they weren't on earth and in a sleep state, then there's a high likelihood they'll be in Summerland and not experiencing that particular experience. So all of these experiences generally happen while they're on earth when they're just going into or just coming out of the sleep state. Yeah. And, uh, and that's when, or, or in their awake state, uh, where, they sit, where a child can see spirits around them. And a lot of times the spirit is just trying to scare them to death, basically. Yeah. And, so that, that pre and that prepares the child for other experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So, AJ, the interaction isn't between spirit body and spirit body in that instance. It's actually um, the child using their, their heightened sensory perception in their physical body to... Yep. Uh, interact with spirits or spirits interact with them? Yes, because, uh, because what's going on actually is that if you think about it, if you're in Summerland, it's going to be very, very difficult for a spirit in a terrible condition to even see you, yeah. you to see your spirit body, I mean. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because your spirit body is a, of a more uh, subliminated form, a higher vibration, mm -hmm. and they can't actually physically even see you in your spirit form. But they can see you in your physical form. And because it's very, very close to, you know, the, the atmosphere here is very, very close to their own dense form as well. So even though they're a spirit, they still have a much denser form. So, so most of the time the abuse actually occurs towards the physical rather than the spirit body mm. for that reason. When I, say most, whoop, I just lost myself to that. When I say most of the time, and obviously every single uh, situation is unique. And when a person describes their situation to me, generally you can just, fr from, from feeling about what's happened to them, so usually when a person comes up to me, I can feel all of their history, and all of you will be able to do this anyway, where you can feel all of their history and you know what events caused what problems. And in particular cases, some very unique cases, there are abusive situations going on in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. But that only generally has occurred in very extreme cases where the child itself has been also involved in abusive acts towards other children. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that there are usually two types of uh, abuse uh, survivors, if you like. One type of a survivor will, will feel that abuse is abhorrent and the other type of survivor will feel that they must be an abuser. That's the only way they, get, they start abusing others. And the child who starts abusing others, by the time they get to nine or ten years of age, quite often has some dark emotions to work their way through. When, they're, uh, when those kind of children arrive in the spirit world, and they're nursed in a, in a totally different location to Summerland, and so that is a unique experience, but they are still nursed through those emotions. They're not left to deal with them alone as an adult would... Uh, not that anyone's alone, of course, but I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be left to deal with them without assistance, whereas an adult has to ask for assistance in the spirit world. 
whereas a child will be given assistance uh, without even asking because their free will is yet to be developed. Mm. Yeah. Does that make Thank sense? Yeah. So every situation with regard to abuse is very different. Um, but the majority of times, the, it's, the physical, it's the physical attack that the person's experiencing. And this is why many spirits who are guiding or guarding the child being harmed take the child out of body. And this is why many of you who have been abused have experienced the out-of-body experience when you're a child. And you'll experience it like you don't even really remember. You remember maybe the first few seconds or minute or so of the abuse and then afterwards. And, you know, the, and the after effects, which are often very unpleasant, of course, you know, where you might be bleeding or you might have other, other problems uh, with your body, but there'll be this sort of gap in between. And this is why many people who have been abused have gaps in their memory and it's because they've actually been taken out of body so they don't have to remember those experiences. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll go down front too. Go on. No, no. Yeah. Go away, go ahead. Um, I had an experience where a spirit entered my body mm -hmm. through my base chakra mm -hmm. and just kind of buzzed, buzzed me. What? That about. And that actually, directly after that, I saw a spirit standing next to my daughter's bed. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I, all this stuff was happening around that time where um, I would wake up 10 minutes before she would wake up. And I know there's a lot of spirit, you know, influence. I'm just wondering if you can speak about that. Um, the spirit's trying to contact to some sexual injuries that you have. And the key is to allow yourself to work through those sexual injuries um, that occurred in your own childhood. Um, because if, if you don't allow yourself to deal with them, then what you're doing is opening up to, spirit, to spirits in that, in that way. So allow yourself to connect to what's really going on inside of yourself when, when that spirit comes to you. There's, there's some feelings inside of yourself just before that spirit comes that if you can connect to those feelings, you will understand why that connection is actually occurring. Um, it's interesting we're discussing spirits now, so, so let's deal with the spirit fear first, shall we? Is that, that's Can I just remind everyone that there are processing rooms in this building if you want to use them. If you go down the hallway past the toilets and follow the human, the, the signage is Human Potentials Office, I think. Downstairs, downstairs. you go downstairs. Um, there's about four rooms down there and if you want to use a room, uh, just close the door and everyone else will know that if the door's closed, it's in use. So when you leave, I open the door again. And there's tissues there for crying. Yeah. And a couple of chairs. Yep. So. Um, is, it, is it closed or locked? Just sectioned off. The downstairs? Is there a problem with using downstairs? No. No, it's the, up, the upstairs is sectioned off, but I'm sure the downstairs isn't. Oh, thanks, 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 Anna. All right, so um, let's look at the spirit issue, shall we? What we'll do is we'll uh, want to show you a few clips. Is that all right? Yeah. Show you a few video clips. And, uh, and we'll see how we go with these. This is going to be interesting to see how I go operating this thing. But we'll <laughs> No, no, um, yeah, you need to switch just that off, yeah, that's it. Can I just say to a lot of you are not staying open to your fear now. Like you've gotten into a state where you're actually living in your fear and you're not staying open to your fear. So perhaps if we could just pause it there for a moment and uh, I just want to help you stay open to your fear. Right? It's pointless doing these kind of exercises 
unless you stay open to your fear. So what you want to do is stay breathing. Remember, just keep your breathing happening. Right? You can feel that tension in you, like where you're starting to get involved in the story and everything and you're starting to feel that fear. And you feel that tension starting to rev up in you. So stop, stop doing that for <laughs> and get back into breathing. Just breathe. You can breathe your way through this, right? This is some tension and fear coming up for you. Breathe your way through that. Don't shut down the process. When you go into this rigid state, can you feel that happening for many of you? Going into this rigid state, what you're doing is you're shutting down the expression or the experience of the fear. What you're doing now is you're living in it. And that's not going to benefit you at all. Does that make sense? You need to keep breathing and actually allow yourself to experience it. Remember, you're allowed to go to, if you need to go out at any time, you can go out and just cry or whatever, that's fine. But you need to allow yourself to experience it. This is a good opportunity to get into that. Does that make sense? So just breathe. So breathe some more. If you want, need to open yourself up a bit more, stand up and do that. <laughs> you can just breathe. Just stay connected with it. The other thing to be... Uh, to, to be a lot of people are worried that watching a movie like this just, just increases demonic attack or increases spirit attack. No. Spirit attack occurs because of your fear. Right? That's what the spirits connect to, your fear. If you release your fear and you stay breathing, spirit attack cannot occur as much because you're now releasing the fear. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to feel the fear and breathe with it. Just breathe, stay breathing. Very important. I just wanted to tell you about my experience of this movie. Um, I watched it about a week ago and I was absolutely terrified and I, I processed quite a bit of terror directly after that. Um, and now I'm watching it and not feeling any fear at all. So, mm. yeah. Yep. So when uh, you were processing the terror, you, you finished up going to bed, didn't you? And, and having the blankets over the top. It was the middle of the day, it was warm. But Mary was in cold and had these blankets over the top of her, just shivering and, and stayed in that state for two or three hours. Yeah. Yeah, does that make sense? If we can just have a mic. We need to be record <laughs> <laughs> We need to be recording these uh, these interactions too, by the way. So yeah. Uh, that, those mics are not going to work because of the way that the sound system's hooked up with the, with the speaker. So if you use that one instead. To process the fear, is it good to drink water or not good to drink water? We're not worrying about drinking water at this point. We want to breathe. <laughs> but so yes, breathing is more important. You need, well, as you're experiencing it, breathe, yeah. But I drink water. Any time you try to get a physical, every time you, if you're in a state of fear right now, like right now, many of you, many of you went into a place of rigidity, right? Where you could feel your tummy lock up, everything locked up, you shut, you shut yourself down, so not breathing, breathe. Many, some of you reached for an alternative distraction, right? Which might be water or something else around you. That's just distracting you from the fear that's there, right? So have your drink of water right now. So you don't need to have one, <laughs> if that's the way it is. And if you feel the need to be distracted, allow yourself to feel that, because that's a part of your avoidance of your fear. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to just feel that, feel that process. Paula? So how can you tell if, you, um, if you're avoiding the fear, or living in it or whatever, or you're just not frightened by it? You're just not frightened by it? You see, every single person will have a different reaction to the same movie. If we've had terror-based events in our childhood that have affected us, then what will happen is that particular thing, this kind of movie will trigger me. But if I haven't had any terror-based childhoods uh, in my childhood related to spirits, this movie will have barely any effect on me at, at all. Does that make sense? So the key is to not overanalyze everything, just breathe, feel your emotions and breathe and you'll soon see whether it's having an effect on you or you're not. You feel your heart rate speed up. You feel your body getting tense in your stomach area. You feel your muscles starting to get tense. There is fear related then, inside of you still. 
Does that make sense? If none of that occurs, then there's no fear inside of you about this particular issue. Some other issues maybe, but not this particular issue. The key is to not overanalyze, just stay in that open breathing state. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And, oh, we need to do this mic here. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I'm so, so thanks for, for this, because I just needed this, and Ken needed that too. Yeah. And I was just wondering if Ken can drop the mic, because this is distracting for him. No, no. well that's up to Ken though. He's got free will, yeah. okay. <laughs> if you want to. He doesn't want it. <laughs> no, so you know, he's got free will, but that's up to him to decide what he wants to do with the mic. All right, well, let's get back into it, shall we? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry? Maybe when you get into the lock up thing. What if we ask, if, if we just ask a question, another question, because there's a highly mediumistic person with a lot of fear about <laughs> spirits asking a question. <laughs> I just want to know, like, when you get into the lock-up condition where you sort of... Where you like, just lock in. What happens to me is I go up and I freeze. Yeah. And all, all my, everything in my head's just saying, I don't want to feel this now. I don't want to feel this now. Yeah. That's all that happens. And usually it's in the night. Yeah. And so what happens is I'll stay in this and then I'll go back to sleep. Okay. And I don't feel like I'm... Because when I'm processing it, it'll go into these wobbles. Yeah, that's like, right. When you're in a state where you were locking it all up, first thing again to remember is diaphragmatically breathe. If you diaphragmatically breathe, force yourself into diaphragmatic breathing, everything starts unlocking. The second thing is look at, look at the, there is a blockage going on. So what I would then say to myself is, I'm allowed to not feel this now. I'm allowed to not feel this now. Because when you say I don't want, when you say in different <laughs> ways other than being allowing, so I'm allowed to not deal with this. The truth is you're allowed to not deal with anything, right? You're allowed to not process any, any emotion. The irony is that when you say that to yourself, you feel often more like you want to. <laughs> Does that make sense? And just the fact that we have the choice, that we've now given ourselves the choice, means that often we say, all right, well, I am allowed to not deal with this, but I actually want to deal with this now. Does that make so Sometimes I'll, yeah. I'll hear a mothering voice saying, it's okay, you don't have to feel it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that, getting me away from it all the time. That's a spirit with you, Josh, um, who's trying to mother you and it help you out of the emotion. Many of you, by the way, will start having messages when you start uh, dealing with your fears, right? The reason why you have messages when you're dealing with your fears is that there are literally groups of spirits around you in different zones around you. So for Josh, you actually have two sort of groups of spirits around you. We have one group of spirits who are trying to influence you into more fear so that they can control you. And then you have another group of spirits who feel they're protecting you. They feel like they're nursing you. They're actually not doing you any good either, but they're hooked into your desire to be looked after through the process. Does that make sense? So again, usually this is what's happening in almost every situation with spirits. If you, and, and it doesn't matter what situation, you usually have two polar opposite groups of spirits surrounding you. And we can illustrate to you after this how that occurs. Uh, some of Millie's experiences have, have heightened that quite a lot, haven't it, with your experiences with the abuser and the, abuse, the abusee, if you like, being in the same place as you at the same time. The abuser trying to abuse the, the abused person, still in the spirit world, through you and through the connection and, and these kind of things all happen. So in your case, the key is to stay open to the emotion. As soon as you get into the, into the emotion of, oh, please help me out of this, please help me out of this, you're going to have a lot of mothering, nursing experiences, nursing sort, sort of spirits who are, who are still in the first fear, by the way, in their mother role, trying to nurse you through the process, which is not actually helpful for your release. You know how you're saying when you go into the, the state of when you've been in that state, yep. did you feel you're processing that? Yeah, in, what, what I do frozen? is breathe, breathe. breathe yeah. Sometimes you, when you're in a frozen state, the only thing you can do is breathe, diaphragmatically. And it's like so. it's releasing from your stomach? It's yep. It wobbling like Yep, this. that's it. And, and fear is stored. You, this is why many of you, when you have fear, you feel it in your third chakra, right, a lot of the time. That's where, a lot of times that's where our fear is stored. And, and if you breathe, you start opening up that. You, you're opening up that emotion in that area of your body. And, and once you do that, 
the soul's base, soul emotion, which is causing this lockup, starts to flow as well. So just keep allowing yourself to breathe. So when you're by yourself, always breathe. When you're watching a movie like this, every time you notice yourself not breathing, stop the movie, get back into your breathing. Back into your breathing. <sighs> back into the diaphragmatic breathing. Into your tummy area, remember? The diaphragmatic breathing is. So into that, breathe. If you've got to lie down to do it, lay down and do it. Get back into the breathing and then come back to the movie. Yeah? Does that make sense to everyone? Yep? Okay. <laughs> got to keep you in suspense for those of you who haven't watched it. So that's the end of that one. Is there any questions you'd like to ask about your fear? Um, I might just grab this microphone because there's a few more things I want to show you. What's the time, by the way? Three o'clock. So we'll have a break after this. None of you will be able to eat. <laughs> so all this, all this food I can take home with me. Can I just... Can I just share something um, that actually happened to me similar to that with my daughter? Yeah. Um, By the way, Liz, before you say it, can, can I just say that that is actually based on a true story and based on the eyewitness accounts of the priest and the parents of the, uh, of the story. So, um, and I'd like to say just a few other things perhaps before you speak, Liz, because Obviously, when you're on the divine love path, expelling a spirit from a person isn't like that. So that's the other thing I'd like to say and make quite clear. <laughs> but um, remember the reason why we're viewing this is to help you connect with some of these childhood feelings that you have. Does that make sense? Because a lot of us have had spirit-related childhood feelings that were, caused us to become afraid. Far away, Liz. Um, my daughter has had spirit possession and um, there's a story behind it but I won't go into it. Um, I was out shopping and she called me to come home because she felt like she wanted to split her wrists. Yeah. So I came home straight away and the spirit itself, I was talking to her and the spirit itself um, was there and was actually talking to me and I just knew that it was. Previously Rachel had said to me that she when the spirit possessed her, she felt herself go way back into the background of, and the spirit was in possession. She felt like she was just a little echo in the background of where she was. Yep. The spirit actually um, confronted me and was yelling and screaming at me. And for some reason, I felt really calm. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just there and I wasn't afraid of it. And in the past, I haven't been afraid of spirits like this before either. Um, but in the end, I just actually just yelled at her. I just called her name and yet called Rachel because I thought that would bring her to. And then she just collapsed on the floor yeah. um, there. So I just yeah. sort of wanted to share that. Yeah. But I am in fear watching this now. Yeah, okay. So there is some f fear f still within, obviously. So what we'd like to do um, after the break is we'll talk a little bit about how to connect and stay connected with that kind of fear with spirit. So I'll show you uh, one more clip from The Sixth Sense as well about spirit sphere after the break. Or would you like to see that before the break as well? So you want to go to the break in total turmoil, is that the idea? <laughs> <laughs> I'll help you do that. <laughs> Why is that so funny? <laughs> Someone was quite funny. Sorry. <laughs> it's amazing what scares us, though, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah. And just imagine walking into a room where it was nowhere near the same as you left it, which a lot of people have done, of course. That's enough, eh? Hey? I don't want to show you too much of that if you haven't watched it because it's uh, a very good movie to watch.
and uh, very enlightening about spirits. But what we'd like to do when you come back from the break is talk a little about some of that spirit stuff and uh, hopefully help you stay connected with some of these tense emotions you feel inside of there. So try to not use food now as a way of getting, <laughs> <laughs> as a way of getting away from them. All right. <laughs> anyway, we'll come back in about 45 minutes, all right? <laughs>